Welcome to the Branding Boardroom, the podcast where we discuss brand strategy and how it should be understood, formulated, and implemented by senior corporate decision makers. Our guests range from prominent CEOs to accomplished academics and thought leaders. But there's so much more. They're also interesting people. And on the show, you'll get to learn about their stories and about the advice that they give to the world's top companies. My name is Ivo Ganchev. I'm your host and a senior executive at Top Brand Union, a Chinese consultancy which publishes influential ranking tables in the branding industry. We also organize the annual China Brand Festival. And this year, it's taking place right here in Changsha, where our secretariat is located. Now follow me into the branding boardroom. Our guest today is Martin Roll, a world-renowned thought leader, global business strategist, and senior advisor to several prominent business families. He's an advisor to several global boards, as well as a seasoned global business strategist with 25 years of board and executive advisory experience. He's a member of the Global Advisory Council of the Wellspun Group, a senior advisor to the early stage venture capital fund Cocoon Capital, and to Supersum. Martin is the founder and CEO of Martin Roll Company. He has served as a senior advisor to McKinsey and Company, and he currently advises Fortune 100 companies, Asian businesses, family businesses, and family offices. He helps clients with strategy, transformation, and leadership, while also serving as a mentor to the next generation of leaders in startups and high-growth companies. Martin Roll holds an MBA from INSEAD, a top global business school, where he now serves as a distinguished fellow and an entrepreneur in residence. Martin Roll has also served as a visiting professor at the China Europe International Business School and regularly teaches MBA, EMBA, and other executive education programs at INSEAD, SIBS, and Nanyang Business School in Singapore, as well as at other renowned business schools. Martin is a member of the advisory board of the Harvard Program on Asia and International Relations and a faculty member and a keynote speaker on the program and on the academies by Harvard student agencies. Martin Roll is an accomplished keynote speaker at international conferences and an experienced presenter at the highest level. He's sought after by some of the world's most influential business conferences. Martin also writes for Inside Knowledge and serves as a regular commentator for global media. He is the author of the global bestseller Asian Brand Strategy, which came out in 2015. Currently, Martin is preparing two new books, Family Business Strategy and Family Office Strategy. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today Martin Roll. Hi, Martin. Hey, Ivo. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Hello from Changsha. Uh, where am I finding you at the moment? I'm currently in my cottage outside Copenhagen in uh, Denmark. Okay, fantastic. Very good. We're very glad to have you here. And clearly, you've had a career full of achievements. So today, we're very happy to talk to you about your story and uh, things that you can tell us about branding and related to China specifically. But let's start at the beginning of your story. Would you mind telling us a bit more about your early days, the beginning of your career, your education, your first corporate role, and uh, what led you eventually to move to Asia? Yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to be here. And I grew up in my uh, in uh, my native uh, Denmark, and I think I originally wanted to become a journalist. I think I would have ended up in uh, broadcast uh, journalism. So while I was at uh, college and uh, business school, I did a lot of uh, journalism. I was writing. I was I was doing uh, things with Danish uh, broadcast uh, corporation, the equivalent to the to the BBC, and so forth. So I really thought I was I was going into journalism, but I had a teacher at, at school and, and he said, you're not going to go in and become a journalist. I think you should be a business guy. So when we had accounting and leadership topics and all that, he kind of encouraged me to to go to business school. So my, my career took a uh, took a different turn at that time. So literally my, my first part of my career was in uh, global advertising. So the first 12 years of my career 
I work with uh, with global brands uh, from a communication, from a marketing, and from a from a brand point of view. So I thought that my life were locked into advertising, to communication, working with brands, which of course became a story later, as we're going to discuss today. But throughout uh, one of the agencies that I work with, uh, DDB or DDB Needham today is called referred to as DDB. One of the big agencies had a great time there back in the nineties. We were encouraged to go to business schools. I ended up at the INSEAD. I've heard about INSEAD. I've heard about these global schools like INSEAD, London Business Schools, Harvard, of course, Stanford, MIT. But my boss wanted us to be much better than the clients. So I got the offer to go to a summer school. There was a summer program called Young Managers Program at the INSEAD in the summer of 98. And throughout that three week, uh, extremely fantastic program, it was very heavy, it was very loaded, we were very busy, it was quite overwhelming because I met a lot of talent, uh, talents from, from the global world, and not people in advertising, people from the management consultancies, people from industry, people from other walks of life, doctors and all that. And I kind of realized what's, what's the thing about the global business school. So I went back and I applied to, to, uh, to, to INSET for an MBA program, because in fact, throughout those 10 years in advertising, I, I had done a lot of interactions with Asia. I have watched the uh, Korea rising, kind of the early news about, you know, China opening up and a lot of stuff that was kind of boss about uh, Asia, but it wasn't mainstream. So I went to an MBA, I got accepted a few months later. And obviously an MBA and INSEAD is a completely different podcast because it was a game changer in so many different ways. But I had a professor at, uh, at INSEAD and he made a profound impact on my future journey because he kept, he, he ran a little elective uh, for the MBAs in the end of my MBA at INSEAD about Asia. And it was so intriguing. And I think that was a catalyst. I kind of knew about Asia. I had that kind of interest. I've been to Asia a few times, been to Japan, I've been to Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. And I knew that I would come back one time. But uh, Professor Schutter, who is now a emeritus professor and a good friend of mine, I call him my guardian angel because he changed my life path. He really encouraged us to go. And, and after inset, most people, you have to go back to the 99 and the 2000s. Asia wasn't very much in demand. We don't. We didn't hear much about China at the time. Asia was just about to 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 opening it up and to start to make an impact on the global world. So I went to Asia, whereas most of my fellow MBA students and friends out of Inside and other schools, they went up to London, they went to America, they went into private equity in California and so forth. And I went to Asia, and in, and in fact, people thought I was crazy. What are you going to do in the Far East? That's a way that the British would refer to Asia. And I kind of knew that the future was Asia. So call it a lucky punch, call it knowledge that other people didn't have. I don't think so. I call it just a very lucky event. And I mean, all the life events of advertising and Professor Helmut Schütte inset and all of that. So I kind of went east where most people back then uh, went west. And it was probably great timing as well. I can kind of relate to your story as I'm uh, listening to it because um, as a fellow European who moved out here for uh, career development, I've had the same question a lot of times. But when you think about it, really, the more that the differences in technology have shrunk over the years, the more that population has come into play. And Asia has clearly uh, around 60% of the world's population. So, of course, uh, it's a big market and it's a place where the economy is... Uh, booming and it's a, a great place for opportunity but you've had uh, so many experience here it's, it's experiences here and especially with uh, fortune 100 clients which is very unique so i was wondering if uh, you could also tell us a little bit more about this uh, what do you regard as uh, some of the pivotal points in your career and some of the highlights uh, in terms of your uh, achievements in asia over the past 20 years no, good, good question, and it, it probably requires a very long answer. We'll do it, the, the kind of the shorter one right here. But I think, as you rightly refer to, I think it, it, it has been and it is a privilege to be able to advise uh, Fortune 100 and obviously a lot of Asian firms, corporations, including uh, Asian entrepreneurs. We shouldn't forget that Asia has a lot of first and second generation entrepreneurs. You see them in, in, in China. Some of them, yes, came out of the, the state-owned enterprises, but we have had a lot of very savvy, very bold, very enterprising founders in, in China, and of course, Asian firms and, and business leaders. So I think that has really been a, a privilege. But when I look at 
my my time in Asia, which spans more than 20 years by now, it, it has like three different phases. There were the first phase where I came to Asia. I helped uh, Asian firms to globalize. But before I could do that, I came from the notion and through my lenses, it was all about building brands. Because if you have a strong brand, which we're going to go back to later, I know, it is really about driving value, getting a market position and to compete. And the Asian firms wanted so much to get out of the native country into Asia and later into the global world. And in particular, the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese had already been there. So that was kind of the first phase, which I'll get back to. Second phase, once you get the trust, is that you do become a strategy, transformation and a leadership advisor because the branding might be the call to action. It might be the reason why you work with that client or you provide that keynote speak in the first place. And then they want you to do much more of that. And then in the third phase of it, I've always done it, but I got aware of it. I started to work with family owned enterprises and family offices, which also has brought me into the to the academic side. So if you go back to when I started out in Asia, I came to Singapore in, uh, in 2000. It was a very different Singapore to the Singapore that I think a lot of us know today. But Singapore was very, very different. It, it came out of a different size. It was much more regional in nature and today has become one of the global hubs and so forth. And there was this underlying notion of that Asia has just recovered. Don't forget that in 2000, the Asian financial crisis in 97 had just had a severe impact on, on most of the countries in Asia, Southeast Asia in particular, Korea, Philippines, all of that. So everyone has been impacted. But of course, now there was this new sentiment that the future was Asia. So I think one of the privileges were to be at the forefront and really being a first mover into Asia. So what you brought in from the Western world, from the global outlook and with an Asia that during the crisis had been hit, had suffered, had been told by the World Bank, uh, a lot of international bodies, what to do, even the Asian Development Bank that actually came out of that notion of what to do in order to become more competitive and more successful. I also think Asia, in a sense, were very ripe for for renewal, very ripe for innovation. And, and there came I, and there were others at that time, but there weren't that many because I was the guy that, that talked about the branding and really no one talked about it. And it, if people knew, if Asian business leaders and business owners knew about it, it was also in this connotation of a, of a logo, of a color, of a famous statement and a slogan. And as we know, we'll get back to it. Branding is so much more than that. One of the turning points were in the late 2005, I published my book called Asian Brand Strategy. I had met a fellow uh, strategy consultant a couple of years early, and he said, if you really want to build your name, you should, you should write a book. And I kind of knew that, and I, and I needed that for my educational purposes because I was doing a lot of work in, in South Korea and Japan, a bit in China. At that time, I was teaching in China and other countries, and I always wished I had a book, not a Western brand book, but a book that was actually made for the Asian corporations. So it kind of spoke to them, spoke to the cultures and the Asian mindsets and all that. The book came out uh, in the 2005, Asian Brand Strategy, and with that followed a Korean and a Chinese and a Vietnamese version. And I and I didn't know what was hitting me in, in just a month after it came out. It, it completely hit me because it became one of the, the bestsellers in 2006 in the Strategy and Business, which is one of the man management consultancies uh, magazine. And the phone started to ring and the email came in. And of course, we were not that digitalized back then. But this was one of the first times that someone really talked about branding from a strategic point of view. Yes, I had the cases of Jim Thompson out of Thailand. I had an early Huawei case story. I had Singapore Airlines and Banyan Tree. What can you do in hospitality? I had a more Pacific from Korea, which was a cosmetics brand that wanted to take on the world and so forth. So that was really new at that time. But it also enabled me, it, it, it gave me a foot in the door because the Asian chairman, the shareholders, the CEO were very intrigued by this novel new concept called a brand. And of course, they knew about brands because they had the Mercedes and they loved Apple and they had the later the iPhones, a little too early for iPhones. But but of course, the notion of branding, talk about luxury brands, the roller Louis Vuitton and all that. But they hadn't really made the connection to what that could be, what that could mean for, uh, for, for their company. And so they called me up on that. 
One of the first countries I, I did a lot of work in were in uh, South Korea. So I've helped a lot of the what you refer to as the chapels in Korea and the families behind them to first of all understand what a brand is from a strategic point of view, all the way down to the very technical, uh, tactical nitty gritty details, but also how do you really build a global framework? And maybe the most important thing that is gonna take time and it's gonna take resources and you need to have the right uh, mindset. And through that journey, it also kind of almost cascaded me back into the, to the Western world, funny enough, because I was that white guy coming from the Western world, heading into Asia, and obviously, I had to learn about Asia, and I'm still learning. I'm 55 years old, and I mean, I'm in the middle of my learning journey because when do you really fully understand Asia? I mean, it's a lifelong journey, right? So while I was advocating and I was teaching, helping Asian firms to globalize, that's also at the same turning point 15 years ago where the Western companies, the global Fortune 100s, got very interested in Asia. So I suddenly got to trade the, the other way around to help Western leaders, Western corporations to understand Asia. It didn't make me the market entry expert. How do you get into Eastern China? How do you get into Thailand as such, but more as a conceptual framework to, to understand Asia. I think that was a very privileged position to be in because I looked at it, of course, from, from two different uh, angles. During that time, I also had the privilege of becoming a keynote speaker. And, and I think that goes a little back to the role of broadcasting and being a journalist. I don't have stage fright. I don't mind being on stage. I don't mind having a point of view. But that came in very handy because I got invited. In the early days, you, you did it without a fee. But later, I learned from, from other management consultants and, and global keynote speakers that you could, you could actually monetize it. And I ended up being a, a, a kind of a, a, a keynote speaker, and I could act it in a, a can command today, a pretty, a pretty steep global international fee level for that. So that also became part of my, my business. So I flew on Singapore Airlines, and at certain times, I think for 10 years, I was one of the top 10 passengers in Singapore Airlines. I was literally flying everywhere because there was such an appetite for Asia to go out into the world, but there was also a huge appetite the other way as Westerners try to understand what's, what's the big deal about Asia, what's the future of Asia, what makes Asia different, how do we really understand Asians and Asian consumers and, and all that. A couple of other points I also had uh, for a couple of years, I've always been very close to them, but I was a senior advisor to uh, McKinsey and Company, so I worked very closely with the marketing practice people in strategy, and I were part of a lot of the different uh, client engagements that uh, McKinsey uh, took on, not only in Asia, but also around in, in markets around the world. So I was almost like the standby expert on branding, on marketing and strategy. So that was very exciting as well. Of course, always with this underlying notion of, of, of Asia. I'd also been teaching. I've always been teaching. And again, back to this, what I called, you know, being able to frame a point of view, not being afraid of being on stage and really if, if you think that you have something to offer if you have if you have a point of view if, if you have a perspective if you have a reflection on insight i think almost like you have an obligation to 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 publicize it to share it and people may not agree with you but at least this is my point of view so i've always been teaching at the business schools and one of my early um uh, kind of teaching stints in Asia were actually with the CIBS, China European International Business School in, in Shanghai, and now with a campus in Zurich and in Ghana. So they have taken on a very bold statement here. I actually went to China in 2003 to run likely the first elective, the first brand management elective for the MBAs back in uh, 2003, which was really exciting because the class was half Chinese and half foreigner. So we had a very good debate, almost like Asia meets West in terms of what is a brand, what can it do for you, get people to understand what it was. We discussed local cases and we discussed uh, global cases as well. So very exciting. Later got to teach at the Nanyang Business School. I started to do again a brand management course because everyone started to talk about branding around 2006, 7, 8-ish. A lot of Asian firms were interested. So I started to, I became a lecturer at Nanyang Business School in 2007 and have been teaching the annual brand management elective uh, since then, and including many other courses at that time. And when I later started to work with family businesses and family offices, I also became a distinguished fellow at the INSEAD Business School. 
the school where I pursued my MBA and probably the school that I never really left when it came to that. But that's kind of another point we can we can talk about. So all in all, I think Asia for me were really, I mean, unraveling strategy, transformation and, and, and kind of leadership topics and, and really gave me that kind of, I would say, firsthand platform and the, the ability and the opportunity to, to work with a lot of firms, not only in Asia, but also on, the, on a global level. It sounds like truly a remarkable career, and you've had so many different experiences. And I'm sure that uh, as our listeners are, uh, are uh, uh, trying to understand how your story developed, uh, they must be wondering what are the qualities and what are the um, things that allow you to reach this level of success. Now, you've mentioned a number of aspects of, for example, timing, for example, the book that you wrote, um, and also the fact that you dare to speak up, which I think is something that uh, we've had in uh, Europe for quite a while. And uh, now recently in the past 10, 15 years, it's definitely come to Asia and in China, where I am, where uh, a lot of the um, business world influencers and entrepreneurs and lecturers uh, do these live broadcasts almost daily. Uh, but what I was wondering as I was listening to you is whether there were any other factors or reasons that you think your personal brand succeeded apart from the timing, the book, and the fact that you dare to speak up. Yeah, I think it, it's partly, I, I tend to believe, part of my, my Danish upbringing and, and the opportunity that I think we give uh, kids in a very early age Denmark, as you know, it's a very equal society. We don't really have a very large distance between kind of low and high level of wealth. I mean, most Danes, if we want to put it very simply, live in kind of the middle class. Everyone go to public schools, more or less. So it's a very equal society. It's a very unified society. But we also have a, a, a view on a certain view on education, the way we view kids, that we give kids very early on a lot of opportunity. We actually allow kids to fail. We allow kids to run outside the boundaries. We allow kids at times to even pass the red line. You're not going to get severely punished for that. And it doesn't mean we educate people to be outliers, but we somehow empower kids. We trust them very early on to say, hey, if you want to pay music, if you want to build a space rocket, if you want to program, if you want to if you want to paint, if you want to work with people or you want to work in humanity in a hospital, I mean, Follow your passion, follow what you want to do. That's basically the life mission that we try to kind of impose into to Danish kids somehow. So I think the trust I was given early on, also back to my parents and whatever you whoever influenced me at, at a very early stage. I never they had never held back and I lived in France, I went outside, I went to language schools, did a couple of things, back to journalism. I was a photographer at some point in time. I'm actually a pretty good professional photographer. So that kind of instilled a certain, I guess, DNA in me to never follow the crowd. And I think that's, I have this kind of personal life mission, which is the freedom to become an architect on your own life. I know it's, I could sound a little quirky. It could be sound very bold, but think about it. Never follow the crowd. If you follow the crowd, it's a safe journey, but you also very often going to end up in the middle. You're not going to take center stage. You're not going to deviate. You might at times fall behind if all comes to it. So try to never really follow the crowd. And I think that's kind of the upbringing, the values, the legacy I got from my, my I would say, my Scandinavian heritage, because we share a lot of the same values in, in Scandinavia. And that somehow, and it boils down to your personality. Of course, this is not for everyone. If you want to build your brand, you're going to get on stage. You're going to be bold because the world is very noisy. And in particular, the last 15, 20 years with the rise of digital, it has become a much more noisy world. Yes, it's given up a lot of opportunities. We can now talk to each other. You and I meet on video and audio here, which probably we'd, we wouldn't do. It would be on a telephone line 20 years ago. So a lot of things has happened. So the, you need to be bold, but you also need to be daring. Because when I pushed the branding concept into Asia, when I started to talk about strategy, how to go global, I had my Asian cases, what to do better. When I started to advise global family firms and family offices and wealthy people, people that own businesses around the world, including entrepreneurs, you are going to be daring to do that because it's, it's human nature to stay in the safe zone. It takes a lot of courage in the morning because human, I mean, we are programmed as humans to survive 
you are not programmed to step out of your comfort zone all the time because inherently you're going to feel very uncomfortable and this is not for most people. So if you want to if you want to change the world, you need to be daring and you can't follow that crowd. So you need to be able to jump outside the comfort zone, not to be reckless. You're not going to jump over the cliff here and you can't swim in the blue ocean all the time. But somehow you're just going to trust in yourself that this is your point of view. This is your mission. It could be a very long path and then you do that. And then you need to be different, right? And that's also what I kind of the skills that I honed throughout the 90s in the advertising career, but in particular when I came to Asia, because what can I teach Asia? I cannot change Asia, but you can maybe, and that's why I found my role as a, as a brand strategist and later an advisor to, to Asian companies, you could end up becoming a catalyst. You can't tell them what to do, but you can maybe inspire them. You can show them best practices. And of course, you're going to respect seniority, you're going to respect elders, you're going to respect Asian values, which I do because most of the people I know, they call me an egg. I mean, I'm, a, I'm white outside, but I might be yellow inside and that's for other people to, to judge. So, I mean, I love Asia. I have this passion for, for Asia. And then you need to have persistence because it's a, it's a long, long journey. So if you want to build your personal brand, it, it's a long walk and you need to have a lot of energy. You'll have sleepless nights. I don't know how many long haul flights I've had on Singapore Airlines Why all the people went to dinner parties or just had time off or read a book back home in the sofa. There I was sitting, you know, on a, a trans, trans-Pacific flight or heading into New York or heading off to Beijing or what do I know? So it's also a decision that you want to allocate sufficient time to, to build your brand. I mean, it, it's not, it's not for, it's not for people that kind of uh, that can't go the, the the long walk here. It takes time and energy, so uh, don't forget that you really need to pull in that. But but first and foremost, it has to be driven by passion for what you do. And I'm truly passionate about the topics that we are talking about today. So uh, so I think that's a fuel you need to to get going. That's definitely an important element: passion, hard work, and of course, as you mentioned, perhaps your background as well, and the fact that um, you really had. A mindset that uh, is very entrepreneurial and it sounds to me almost like a high risk high reward investment strategy uh, because uh, you can either make it big or you have to dare to fail and then to pick yourself back up but i guess that's what you have to do if you want to succeed in the business world um, so you mentioned that one of the reasons that you believe uh, your personal brand and your career has been so successful is that you were able to go to a place where people didn't want to go. You were able to, in a way, almost um, go against the trends or against, quote unquote, the market, if you looked at it that way. Uh, so what would you tell professionals on our podcast or um, entrepreneurs that are looking for um, the next big place of opportunity or area of opportunity? How should they position themselves to become the next Martin role? Where is the opportunity for growth during the next perhaps 10 or 20 years? And this could be an area of the world or a, a certain field of business or a, however, I guess uh, you see it right now. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to uh, to create uh, your own brand and, and kind of, uh, but, but as I said before, it's really about follow your passion and and that passion may not show up at your doorway, I mean, in, in, in first sight. It might be hidden in plain sight. I mean, I thought I was becoming a photographer. I, I went into journalism. I worked with advertising. I went abroad to learn languages. And I mean, is, was that a linear line? Probably not. I mean, it has a lot of bumps on the road. And I questioned myself. But I also believe that, uh, you know, in the end, it's gonna, that patchwork is going to showcase where, where, where life is going to take you. So first of all, if you want to build your brand, you should never give up. I think that's the most important thing. And that's what you learn if you're special forces, if you're in special units in the police force and whatever kind of commandos or command structures that you're part of, that one rule here, you never give up. You're going to believe in yourself. You're going to believe in the journey that you, you're going to take on. First and foremost, you're going to trust in yourself. Because when you start to do something which is out of the ordinary, something which is not the common path, something that people may not have done before, People start to, I wouldn't say they don't trust you, but they might question you. They might challenge you. They might, they may see you as a threat because Martin is different. Eva is different. Why, why do you have a different point of view than the mainstream? We know in the years to come, it may become the mainstream, but in order to move the needle, it takes a lot of forces to get that kind of super tanker into, into the speed of it. So in order to 
to create a movement, it takes a, it takes a little step by step, and then suddenly, of course, you have a big movement behind it. So you need to be there. You need to dare to be, you know, different and really to to stand out. And you shouldn't mind to stand out. It doesn't mean you're going to be the guy or the girl shouting all the time. And it's not about being different for the sake of being different. It's because you're going to bring simply just a, a, a different uh, point of view. And then you need, before you start the journey, which I'll get to, you also need to have, I think, a very high energy level because it can be very tiring at times. And at, at this notion where Think about if you start to build your global brand, and I mean, you might speak Chinese for a start, or you might speak Spanish, or you come out for, or you come from a different culture. But in this day and age, almost like by the very nature of our digital tools and the way to broadcast your messages, we are global. And back in my career, 20, 30 years ago, we were not global the same way. It was telefax, it was physical. We didn't have the social media access. We didn't have the extremely sophisticated uh, technology uh, kind of elements that you have today. So, so you really need to have that kind of energy because it's got to be very tiring to do that. And then you need to keep updating and I would say upgrading, not only updating, but also upgrading yourself in terms of what you're going to deliver. So where would I look? I see many, many opportunities. And of course, Asia, the future is Asia. Um, and we talked about it for the last 20 years. And I think we acted at the turning point where Asia is truly going to be living up to the potential that uh, Asia has, but has we, have we fully tapped into it? I don't think so. I think Asia hasn't even started yet. Think about the ASEAN. China is one thing. It's already that sh it's such a big market, such an influential power, such an influential culture. But I mean, you've got, you got the rise of India. We've got the rise of the ASEAN countries, 1.2 billion people and rising. There's so much to do in Asia. So first of all, Asia is still there and it's still a blue ocean. What you're going to do in Asia depends on the development. Of, there will be a lot of work to do in the digital age, a lot of work to do with governments. There'll be a lot of work with climate, climate and consumerism and all that could be another big party as well. But then I would also look at other parts of the world and I'm started to kind of look at that myself. I'm very big on Africa. I know we have been waiting almost for the African continent over the last 30, 40 years with a lot of different attempts, not successful all the time to really get Africa to, to rise. But I truly believe because of access to technology, education that have been done, Africans that have blended into the, and become global nomads and brought back home like Asians also originally 10 years ago, but also 30, 40 years ago, went to Harvard, went overseas, worked for Loyal, worked for German car makers, worked elsewhere, got inspired and went back home to, to build that in. A lot of Chinese have done it learned, got educated abroad, got an idea, went back home and made Chinese companies even better. We have seen it with a lot of Vietnamese returning, for example, back from, from America. Uh, that goes almost all the way back to, to the war in Vietnam. And we see a lot of Asians and including anyone that came to Asia and inspired that region to do that. And I think Africa could form a very, very interesting opportunity in, in, in the years to come because of the infrastructure Africa needs because of the natural resources that Africa represents. And think about the sheer size of the entire African continent in terms of population, in terms of GDP growth and what needs to be done in Africa and, and likewise. South America, the same thing. I think it's still a very untapped opportunity. Of course, we have heard about the BRIC countries was a term that was framed many years ago that included Brazil. Uh, but there are many other countries, aside from still a very dominant Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and so forth, Latin America as well. So a lot of stuff to, to do in, in those countries. And then the Middle East, I'm very bold on the Middle East now also with the kind of the future of oil and energy and what it means, for example, for, for oil exporters like a Saudi. What is Saudi going to do in the future? How are they going to play in the energy sector? We see infrastructure being built. I mean, MENA, I mean, the Middle East region in itself is huge, representing a lot of cultures, of course, within the Muslim, but also the, the Christian and, and the Hindu world. There's so much to do when it comes to, to the Middle East. So if I were to build my brand, I would still bet on Asia, but I would also look elsewhere because there's a lot of pattern recognition. And we're talking, I mean, you talk a lot about if you want to work and act and live in a, in a global world, you need to have transferable skills. And a lot of the skills that I learned in Asia, that I acquired in Asia, and the experiences that I took from Asia, together with Asian leaders and Asian firms, those can be brought into Africa, South America, and the Middle East. And that's currently also what I'm doing. I, I tend to spend around 
my time across uh, 40 different countries every year, of course, pre-pandemic and also now post-pandemic getting into it. So I think a lot of the skills, a lot of the learnings, the the rise over maybe a span of 20 years that I saw in Asia, I think that's transferable to a lot of the other regions in the world. So there's also a lot of, a lot of work to be done. I think all of these things that you just mentioned, they were just such a, a great summary of, uh, of some of the trends that we've, uh, we've been seeing over the past decades, starting from um, the qualities that people need to succeed and the fact that, for example, some of the big companies um, tend to be quite fond of people who have a good background in sports or in uh, the military or in similar areas. And uh, I started myself, uh, the beginning of my career was um, uh, coaching other people how to get uh, top-end internships. And uh, these were the types of people that had uh, certainly a bit of an advantage there. And um, the other things that you mentioned are also um, things that I've seen myself as well over the years. My students in London, uh, where I used to teach uh, from Vietnam, they used to go back and uh, start their own businesses and use their family connections. And it's really helped to uh, push forward the development of, um, of both Vietnam and, and Asia, and also the connections between Asia and the global south, which you mentioned are an area that uh, possibly has a lot of potential. Uh, but um, of course, you're arguably best known for your book, uh, Asian Business Strategy, and that's something that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about as well. Um, so there are, of course, a lot of things that uh, both myself and our audience could uh, learn from you about uh, branding in Asia. And I was wondering if uh, you could tell us a bit more from your perspective about why do you think that uh, Asian brands have been becoming uh, increasingly more prominent recently, and how is their rise engineered and managed at the moment? Yeah, no, very, very interesting and, and kind of important question. If you look at uh, Asia, it's almost like it comes in in kind of two different two different frameworks because Asian brands twenty years ago was was very different to the brands that you see coming out of Asia today. They are much more complex, much more sophisticated. Um, they're much more self-assured. Um, they know what they're doing. Whereas 20 years ago, I mean, it was it was very early on for a lot of the the Asian curve, the, the Asian uh, brands. So I think there's been a learning curve uh, going on for for Asian managers, brand marketeers, the CMOs, and the business leaders. Because in the end, brands can only run successfully if they are anchored in the boardroom. If there is a top understanding in the company, including the board, including shareholders the chairman and the CEO. And I know that's a bit of a kind of a brutal statement here because originally Asian brands kind of were left to to live in the tactical marketing department, which is nothing wrong about it. When I started to remember, I did a few speaks from for, for Samsung many, many years ago. They had 800 people already in the in the global marketing department in, in Seoul, but you still had marketing represented at the top level. Uh, Samsung, for example, early on in the 90s hired a, a Korean American uh, that came to, to, to Asia, lived in Seoul, and actually had an office next to the chairman. This was by the late 90s, because the chairman of Samsung, the late uh, Mr. Lee, understood that, that it was all about uh, strategic endeavor here. So marketing really had to be elevated at that, that time. So what had happened over the last 20 years is that Asian marketers have become much better. They have had global exposure. So whether you're Korean or Chinese, Singaporean, you went to the Western world and you learned and you had a lot of Westerners that went into Asia. So just the learning curve, the, the sheer exposure of experiences and what, what are some of the best practices from the top 100 or the top 500 uh, global brands in the world, of course, have filtered down into Asia and into the, to the Asian boardrooms. But of course, there's still a lot of hard work. And, and I think often Asian firms under kind of tend to underestimate the, the work that it really uh, takes to, to do that. But it's also a way, it, it, there's also a cultural component to it because originally I think Asia, Asia was a place where we looked at Asia as being very, where we had like separated countries. It, it had a bit of an exotic notion. It was in a sense very homogeneous because there was this underestimation what Asia had to offer. And it was, if I may be so freely, because I lived so many years in Asia, Asia was kind of invaded by Western images, Western brands. So whatever came from the Western world, whether you 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 exported dreams out of California, call it an Apple or a Coca-Cola, the American spirit, 
whether you were a German car brand, it came with the notion that German quality, whether you were a Mercedes or a BMW, Volkswagen, you trusted the quality, right? What about beauty out of out of France, or out of Paris, cosmetics and skincare, those brands, and fashion out of Milan and Italy? I mean, so it's like almost like culture and brands almost came from the Western world. And maybe for some of the countries in Asia, it was it was because of the colonized Asia. I mean, the Brits left uh, Singapore back in, in the late 50s and so forth. So there was a lot of, there had been a lot of infusion of, of kind of Western dreams and that. But that has changed because brands in the end represent popular culture because brands have to resonate with consumers. So brands have to have a home. They need to have an anger. They need to have a mom and dad and they need to have some content. And a lot of that content come from popular culture. So now Asia has a much more, I think a lot of us have always seen Asia as being very modern, but I think that notion also had to came, to come to, at times, very humble Asian leaders, that Asia has a lot to offer. This is not only about what comes out of California, what comes out of Stuttgart and Paris and, and, and all those global brands that we tend to think about. Now there's a much more urban Asia. Think about the digitalization out of uh, China, for example. You've got very sophisticated digital platforms. You have some digital brands that are, that are punching very hard and does very well. Asia has been much more connected. Asian consumers have started to, I would say, endorse, embrace, maybe even love some of the Asian images and music. Think about that there has been a, there's a Bollywood uh, kind of a phenomenon we had the Cantonese pop stars back in time, the the rise of Korea in terms of the Hallyu, which I've been involved in. I mean, the rise of of the Korean wave, which is huge and which has really meant billions of dollars in export for Korea. Plus, it has also elevated maybe Korea's, Korean people's perception of their own culture. And for example, for the Chinese, because they by and large love the Asian, the, the Korean dramas and the Korean movies and all that. So that has been a way for Korea to elevate made in Korea, but also to showcase to the world what makes Korea different uh, in, in, the, in the global landscape. And that's where brands come in. So where brands used to be maybe hidden in the tactical marketing department, it was kind of a function. It was not a mindset, but it was more some tactics. Now that has become much more value driven. It has been top led. We got Asian marketeers, native Chinese who have learned overseas, studied hard, seen what other people have done, and they're now bringing that back into the Chinese boardrooms and, and any boardrooms in Asia for that matter. So branding maybe has moved as almost like being a cost on the P&L statement, the profit and loss statement, to become an asset. And I think that's the way we need to look at brands. Brands are really assets. These are economic drivers of, 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 of competitiveness but also of uh, economic value for a company. So where it started maybe very tactical, and I don't blame Asia for that because Asia had been very busy because Asia is an old uh, trading region. There's been a lot of trade, there's been a lot of agriculture, a lot of people, but we didn't get to that level. And, and I think brands is, is part of economic development. So when you start to build your economies, you start to scale up. At that point of time, you also start to think about what truly what brands can 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 do society, to, to society. So, and this is where I've been in all of that for the last 20 years, been a very exciting journey because when I came out of INSET, fresh out of my MBA in 99 and settled in Singapore, Asia was very different. And you had to think hard about Asian global brands, which is a thing I talked about all the time. And you could argue, what is really a global brand? Is it size and volume? Is it revenues, number of countries that you export to? Is it consumer awareness in all the countries in the world, or what is it really? But I mean, it is about having impact and, and bringing Asian popular culture out. And for example, the Korean one is a very good and exciting one. And of course, it also leads, which we're going to talk about later, made in China and the role of Chinese brands in the world. Of course, yes. I think that a lot of the things that you uh, mentioned had to do not just with uh, the business world purely, but also with the development of societies, with historical trends, with the fact that in many ways um, there are quite a few parts of the world that are in a post-colonial stage still and that are still finding um, the projection of their own voice and image into the world. And that's certainly the case, for example, in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia that you mentioned. Um, but you spoke also about culture, and culture, of course, permeates everything, 
whether it's uh, from the consumer's perspective or in the boardroom. And what uh, I was wondering uh, about is whether you believe that from the perspective of uh, Asian executives and in the Asian boardroom, the idea of a brand is understood the same way as it's understood, for instance, in uh, Europe and the West. So uh, whether there is a profound cultural difference that we should be aware of, or whether uh, we are moving towards a more unified understanding of what a brand is and what a brand does. No, I think when it comes to it, a brand in the end drives shareholder value and it drives impact. So if we take shareholder value, maybe in time of dollar terms and, you know, brand equity leads to certain X amount of EBITDA and post-tax earnings and all that, because otherwise, why would you build a brand? A brand is a way to differentiate yourself. It's a way to express to the world why you are unique, why you can defend yourself and all of that. So it, it's kind of bringing shareholder value, but it's also about driving impact because brands are touching people's lives in a, in a functional matter your car drives better than mine, it drives faster, it's more safe, but it's also on the emotional level. So what does it do? I just like you. I just like your brand. Why Why do you like Apple? Why do you like Alibaba? Why do you fly a certain airline? I just like it, which is a very emotional response. Sometimes consumers cannot boil it down to a rational construct. Brands are, um, um, are more than anything else very much about an emotional construct. It's about a bond between the brand and certain consumers or, or customers. So our brand is very unified. Now, Asia, I think, for a long time, failed to understand what, what brands were really all about. Because think about it, what really built Asia over the years were, were people with financial acumen and people that came from engineering. And, and Asia needed that. That was a very natural starting point. But when you're going to build brands on the sophisticated level, the way that you see, for example, the French luxury brands are working with brands, the way that the German car operators, BMW, BMW Mercedes, uh, Volkswagen, which are, which are really first in, I mean, best in class when you think about it, luxury brands, the Cokes of the world, all of that. It's a very complex kind of way of operating because brands don't sit in a, they, they don't sit in a department somehow. There has to be someone managing it. And in my world, it is still the chief marketing officer or the chief sales office or achieve something. But the point is, it has to be at the strategic level and it has to be endorsed by the, by the CEO. Often, when Asia started and when Asia starts to build brands, it sits in a very technical marketing department. So what Asia needs to get at is that it, it's about culture. It's about everyone in the company. For example, take Singapore Airlines. You think it's, um, it's a brand which is very well known. There's a myth about the Singapore girl, the stewardesses, which obviously has been the face on the front of the airline, but that's the least of it. Of course, it comes with a lot of training and upholding the standards, educating the Singapore girls and the pilots and the staff, but it's much, much more than that. It's everything in the company. It's a service level. It's a hotline. It's a quality of the cleaning in the aircraft. It's a food you serve. It's a wine on board. What happens if my back got lost? It's all the touch points. And that boils down to a company and to an organization. And suddenly this is way too important for the marketing people alone. And that's why it needs to sit at the top level. So it has to sit in the boardroom, but it has to be managed by marketeers. And this is where, and it takes a certain level of empowerment. Because if you're a Singapore Airlines, which is a mid-size, it's a, it's a large company and it is the flying flag of Singapore. They have thousands of employees and you cannot refer to the CEO or the management team what to do all the time, but you need to have a really thorough understanding what Singapore Airlines stands for and what the brand does not stand for. Strategy, first and foremost, is knowing what not to do. So you need to have a very unique understanding of, in this case, the Singapore Airlines brand, whether you're a stewardess, a pilot, baggage handler, refueler, customer service, after sales service, travel agent, I mean, anyone that's who, whom are part of the ecosystem of the airline. And this is where leadership comes in. So it's a much more, it's a much more holistic uh, way of running it. And this is maybe where Asian business leaders need to understand the complexity, the resources that goes into it, not only in dollar terms, but also in terms of just educating people, running workshops, running training, looking at SOPs, standard operating procedures, how to build culture, because in the end, it's not, about, it's not about manuals. It's not about having lengthy paper and 
in-depth description of what to do when things go wrong or what the brand is. We need to have that. I know that. We need to run a thorough company and organization here from a professional point of view. But it's really about building culture. And I think, and I use Singapore Airlines deliberately as a good case. It is an airline, so how does it refer to a gas station or a coffee chain or a big technology company, for example, in China? I think there are a lot of similarities. So it has to be fully integrated as, as part of the organization. It has to be about touch points because brands, companies are touching people's lives in so many ways, different channels, different timings on different products and services. But if you want to stand for something, you need to be pretty unified. So you need to think about all those different uh, touch points. And then, of course, you need to trade markets. You need to build loyalty. You need to have your logo in place, design and all that, which for me, it's much more technical hygiene factors. But the most important thing is to, to craft and not let the market craft for you. You have to decide. I mean, strategy is a deliberate action. You as a leader, you as a brand owner, you as a chief brand officer, you're as a Chinese entrepreneur running a billion dollar uh, engineering company, a digital firm, is really to understand what the brand can do for your customers and consumers. And a large part of that, even though your, your products and services have a large technical component to it, it's very much still about the emotions. And the problem with emotions is, I mean, emotions are beautiful. They can be hard to control, but that's what people take away from your brand, even though you don't ask him to, you can't ask people to love you. I mean, if I'm going to create a strong bond over time with your brand, first of all, I need to know the basics. What's your name? What you do? Why you're different? Why you're that beautiful? Over time, I need to know who is your parents? Where, where do you come from? What's your background? What's the province you're from? What's it, what brought you up? What are the values? Back to the values I talked about, my, my Danish background, and of course, the influence I had in Asia. And then over time, you start to develop a relation. And that's where, in the end, consumers with brands build that bond. It does take time. A brand cannot shout to people, could you please love me? Could you please desire me? Could you please adore me? You can't do that. It's something that you earn over time. And that's what I think Asian business leaders have, have learned over the last 20 years. They're still learning. There's still some, some work to do. And sometimes we can mirror that experience in what the Japanese learned after World War II, where they have simply had to recraft Japan because there was no industry. And of course, with a lot of the mystery that the World War II brought also in Asia, they had to restart from scratch. And they did that. But they also went to Harvard, they went to MIT, they went back home and they built Japan over a span of, let's say, 50 years with the Toyota and the Mitsubishi and all that. The first wave of brands in Japan. Later came Korea. And in 1979, the president of Korea got assassinated. He was actually the father of the Korea had a, had a female president some, some years back. She got indicted. So it was a bit of a, a, a scandal in Korea. But her dad got, got assassinated back in 79. He was the president of Korea. But he also brought, I mean, he was, some people believe, very heavy handed. But he also brought a lot of newness to Korea. So where Korea had to recraft what, what Korea meant to the world, Korea knew that they had to get out into the world. And of course, with the Asian financial crisis. So they looked at a lot at what the Western brands have done, but also what the Japanese brands have done. Because for them, they were the first, the, the, the front runners back in the 80s and the 90s uh, for, for Asia. And I think for, for the future of, of Asian brands, I mean, Chinese brands can also learn a lot about the Japanese journey and the Korean journey. And then again, not only do what other people have done, but also bring that kind of newness to it. So in the end, back to your question, what a brand does, a brand is a unified thing. There's no difference between a Chinese brand, an American brand, Canadian, French brand. The notion of branding, what brands does to people, does to the bottom line, does to society remains the same. But of course, you're going to bring your own differentiation to it. And Asia going to bring certain newness, Asian culture, all of that. But in the end, the input and the output remains the same. It's just a question of finding out where you fit into the portfolio of global brands. It's a very interesting uh, anthropomorphic take, I guess, that you have on brands. You almost see them like uh, people that invoke certain emotions and, um, and make people uh, feel a certain way about themselves. Uh, and you also spoke about the fact that this needs to uh, be triggered by sort of a proactive strategy and by taking action, um, which is 
certainly a very interesting way of looking at uh, brands as something that's almost alive in and of itself. But you also spoke about a lot of the lessons that um, different countries or different regions can learn from each other. And as a European who uh, has so much experience in Asia, I was wondering whether there were some parallels between the two when it comes to perhaps the development of companies or of the two societies or of the two regions at large that, uh, uh, that you regard as particularly important. No, absolutely. And as much as any Asian culture, China versus Singapore, you know, Malaysia versus any other country. Of course, Asia is very rich. Asia is very complex. Asia is, 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 a, is a construct of so many things. So is Europe, as we know. It's also a complex patchwork of things. But I think some of the common denominators are, are legacy and, and heritage. As much as you got a lot of modernity and, you know, the race for digital, the, the race for tomorrow. And we know Asians... As much as Asians love their 5,000, Chinese love their 5,000 years of history and their very long histories and roots in, in, in most Asian societies, the same goes for Europe. So I think this notion of legacy and heritage values, whether from family, whether from, from society, the role of people in society, I, think, I see a lot of similarity between Asia and, and Europe, and thereby brands also reflect and, and kind of renews what we do in our lives. Think about the French luxury brands that I talked about. Think about, you know, the car brands we talked about. Some of the brands out of Scandinavia, right? I mean, we got Lego, the toy company, you know, we got we got furniture, we got, you know, food brands, Carlsberg, the beer brand. It really reflects the way of life. And I think the similarities go to Asia. So when Asia have successfully built brands, think about when Sony came out. Sony was really reflecting the way of life in Japan. Samsung is archetypical Korea. Samsung is a very global brand today, and I must give them, they have come a very, very long way. They almost stood up against Apple. I mean, who dares to do that? Because Apple is a very powerful brand. But Samsung has carved out a distinct position for themselves, which is at the same time global, but also very uniquely Korean. So I see a lot of similarities in terms of how society, but also how legacy and heritage plays kind of a, a very important role because societies in Asia and Europe, by and large, are very old societies. They have a long history, and that one we share. And in the end, it's not about being nationalistic, but it's about what are the components, what are the content that we're going to put in, in our brands that then consumers are going to take out of it. Because when you buy a German car brand, you buy a car because you look at the functionality, whether it serves the purpose, big family car or fast sports car, whatever you need. But you're also buying a little piece of Germany. You're buying a little piece of German quality with the notion that comes with that. So society is a very important part of, of a building brand. The difference is, and I've referred to that before, and, and, I, and think that's currently the difference, but it's also eroding, which is what I, what I've referred to for many years as the Asian inferiority complex. I know it's a very provocative statement by a Westerner, but I've been in Asia long enough, so, so I kind of dare to put that forward. And it's, it's ceasing, maybe. It's, it's diminishing. But it has always been that the Asia kind of loved brands from the Western world, as much as they were modern, very novel, very innovative, fast and all that. But by and large, the reason why I think Asian, Asian consumers for long loved and craved for the Western brands is because they had some kind of that kind of legacy and heritage. Of course, with the Apple new company, I mean, Apple was formed, I know, in 73 or back in the 70s, but, but oh, I mean, recently in the last only 20 years, it really became very relevant to a lot of people. But it still represents some values about America, you know, do what you like to do, the design, or all of that, the innovation that you put into it in, in Silicon Valley. So what Asian consumers got out of the Western brands were, has to stand up to the test of time, has to be modern, has to be edgy, has to serve my purpose right now. But there's also a, a much, much deeper, maybe very inherent, maybe subconscious I would say, response to, to Western brands. And I think that's exactly the opportunity that I think Asia has. And that's why I followed and I, and I advocate the Korean way because Korea, I think this public-private partnership between the Korean government and private enterprises being, you know, model agencies, uh, record producers, the movie industry, all of that, that has really created the popular culture out of Korea. 
has been a beautiful construct between government, a private, what I call a private public partnership. So Korea has been very aware of what Korea has to offer and they're not shy about it, but of course it takes time to, to build that. I think this is the same opportunity for other countries and the same opportunity for, for China. There is, there is a lot for um, countries and companies to do together, and there is a lot to be learned from what you're saying. Definitely, the story of Korea has been one of the classic examples in this regard. But speaking more broadly about Asia, you uh, mentioned that it's a complex region. It's also a very big region. Um, as we mentioned before, it has around 60% of the world's population. So it's uh, the largest um, region in the world. And I was wondering how you think about Asia uh, in terms of different sub-regions or in terms of different parts that have similar characteristics, whether you regard it as an area that could be conveniently split into different, for example, cultural zones or economic zones, or whether you think of it as a whole or whether you'd rather look at different countries. I think back in the old days, I think we, we looked at Asia as being very separated countries, right? But I think the modern Asia is much more of an overlapping concept. So you could, you could slice it up from an economic point of view and you will find a very sophisticated uh, Singaporean economy. And you can see a Chinese economy, which is very different to the China you found maybe just 10 or 20 years ago. But in order to, don't try to understand Asia 100% because I think it's simply too big and I think it's, it's too complex. I would rather see it as different overlapping circles that, that inspires each other, governments that are working together. For example, the notion of ASEAN, which is to build simply a free trading block, and, but also to learn from each other because culturally there are certain overlapping roots in, in, in Southeast Asia between the Southeast Asian nations. So if you want to divide it up, I would probably look at Korea and Japan, because they share as much as they have a bit of a, a, a past history with wars and, you know, mistrust and all that. They, they also share a lot of commonalities in the way that they have built infrastructure, the rights of government, the way they have brought, in all fairness, maybe the first wave of Asian brands to the world. So, so kind of Korea, Japan is maybe one block. The other block, of course, is China, because China is for the sheer size of it. But yet again, China is not China. China is a lot of sub-regions. It's a lot of different economic development zones. Innovation takes place in different ways. You go all the way from farmers in the countryside to urbanization. So, so that's a block in itself. And then you've got Southeast Asia. What holds it together, I think it's more like values. I mean, there's a certain... There's a certain Asian notion of, you know, Confucian roots, whether you are we have kind of you know, Muslim background, or you have Hindus, or your Christianity, all of that, because you have a lot of religions and Taoism and all that, a lot of religions in Asia. There's still this role of, what I like about Asia and the way to divide it up is, is to look at, you know, modern and very innovative versus conservative and, and history and legacy. And in many ways, that kind of coexists in Asia. I mean, go to Korea, they have long, long roots, they have a lot of conservatism in society, which is partly reflected in business, partly reflected in politics, partly reflected in the healthcare system in society. But then at the same time, you've got some of the most innovative, dynamic, at the forefront companies and brands in the world. And the same goes for China. China has a lot of uh, pride in history, a lot of pride in Chinese culture, whether that's uh, food, the past, the emperors, the nature, the sheer size of China, the war that China fought. I mean, what made the modern China today? And that also kind of coexists. So in order to break it down, it's not so much about borders, but I think it's more about mindsets in a sense. So sometimes things that you find in, in China could have so much in common with Singapore. And sometimes things you find in the Philippines might just resonate so well with people in Vietnam and Korea. So I mean, I've really seen that develop and Asia has come together. And I think a lot of nation borders are as much as we have a bit of politics and we have, you know, certain disagreements that plays in Asia. So we leave that aside. I think Asian consumers have also come together in a sense and kind of realized we have so much and we probably have more in common compared to what uh, what makes us different. Yeah, that is a very useful way to, to look at Asia for sure. And it also opens up the possibility of uh, much greater integration among the economies and among consumers. 
as well, which uh, of course opens up more business opportunities as well. Um, so speaking about Asia, of course, uh, we can't avoid the topic of China, which is clearly the biggest uh, integrated market um, in Asia and at the moment in the world, if you look at um, the uh, both the population and the, the purchasing parity uh, of people. So when we think about China and Chinese brands, uh, the perception of Chinese brands in the world has been changing recently. They've started to um, attract a lot more positive attention domestically and to go international as well. So when you look at Chinese companies and Chinese brands, what are, in your view, some of the challenges and the opportunities that they face at the moment? I think it's, I mean, China is probably in the middle of the education curve when it comes to, you know, the brand toolbox and, you know, what does it take to scale a company? And I mean, there are a lot of similarities to what, you know, the likes of the Samsung and what the South Korean companies have learned over the last, I would say, 30 years. Now, we know China is moving fast. China is very bold. You represent some very big companies, meaning there are a lot of scale, there are a lot of resources behind it, which sometimes might be a little easier because you simply have the scale to move fast, to maybe take the risk to take those failures, to learn how to build brand. And, and with that also comes what probably characterizes China and with the risk of being political incorrect, China is also a little late to the table in terms of bringing global brands out. But being a first mover is not always an advantage. I mean, think about the Japanese. First of all, they spent 50 years on it. They had to work hard about it. Because so often when you have clusters of brands doing the same thing, it's going to benefit you because it's going to create a market. It's going to create competitiveness, distinct position. And positioning is about being positioned against someone else. So it was probably tougher for the Japanese and Koreans to, to do it. Now, China is moving fast because the learning path has been enormous in Asia. So being so innovative, being China has really embraced digital. We thought the Koreans and the Japanese had kind of fixed digital. But look at what China had built, built I mean, brought to the world. Before this, we, you and I had a discussion about WeChat. And I mean, there's so many things which is almost like developing, I mean, real time out of China in terms of digital. And they move, move very, very fast. That's a good thing because those are very important building blocks for, for building Chinese brands. But China also needs to make sure that they move branding up and into the boardroom that we talked about. Because a lot of the current Chinese companies, of course, partly with the history of the state-owned enterprises, but also because China for years, like a lot of other kind of emerging countries and huge economies, they, they embrace financial and engineering schools if we want to simplify it, which is not quite true, but just to put it very simply. So those financial skills, partly management skills, but also the role of engineering. That's why China became very digitalized. That's why China had built fantastic technology companies. That's how China could build infrastructure in a very rapid uh, period of time. But marketing and branding requires different skills. Back to the emotions we talked about. How do you measure emotions? How do you you cannot go out in the global world and tell the world, could you please love my brand? It doesn't work that way. You earn the stripes. You earn the trust slowly but steadily. If you are steadily showing to the world what you do as a brand, regardless of what sector and industry that you, that you come from. China has the benefit that you can rapidly, you are already doing that. A lot of them have done it learn from global brands and best practices, not to mirror completely what the Loyals is doing and what the LVM8 and the Mercedes are doing, but look at them, review them like the Koreans, that the Koreans have studied in depth, I've seen it in person how they do it, what other people, other brands have done, and then bring that back to a, to a Chinese uh, context. So it's really about thinking about how do we transfer those skills and experiences from the global world into a Chinese context. And, and because Back to my point about not being a first mover, and I know it's not to be politically incorrect. A lot of the, if we think about WeChat and many other concepts have been pretty first moving, a lot of stuff out of Tencent and Huawei, pretty good technology that comes out. But it's also about not only being the 17th mobile brand, because there are a lot of mobile brands, there are a lot of car brands. I mean, China has had over the last 15 years a huge inroad into the automotive sector. It's still a notion of a car, but now, for example, with electric cars coming out, how is China going to play that in an innovative way, which is still broadly adaptable by the global consumer? 
yet also with a distinct Chinese angle to it. So I think that's a bit of the challenge for China to adapt to the global mainstream, yet building that differentiation, which is, uh, which is Chinese, which is what Singapore Airlines did, which is what some of the brands out of Korea have done, Japan and, and any other country in the world. China is a little less known to global consumers and customers, maybe, and, and that's not a criticism. It is just the sheer fact that China only opened up in recent history. So a lot of Chinese products and services and brands, we had that discussion when we talked about ranking and, you know, what's the role of, of Chinese brands. A lot of Chinese brands are just less known to the global consumer. So there's also a bit of an awareness challenge for the Chinese companies to, to, to do that. And with that come the role of trust. How can you trust someone if you don't know them? So it, it goes in that kind of brand funnel. First of all, you build awareness. Who are you? What are you offering? And in the end, all the way down to what I call that bond between the market, country, and, and, and a brand somehow. And with that also comes made in China. And with that, China has to explain what is our quality like? What is our trademark like? Why can you trust us? What goes into our engineering? What, what about those emotions? What about our solutions and all that? So there's also a bit of work to be done on the, on the Made in China brand. But other countries have been this, through the same thing. You go back in the 60s and the 70s, people didn't have a clue about what Singapore stood for. Think about Korea back in the 80s. I mean, they weren't really global. It was very much a country that was kind of encapsulated around itself. The same with Japan, as we talked about. So it's really a rise of a nation. And what comes with that, and that's why I made the reference to the Korean wave and the Hallyu, where China or, or where Korea has really, in a very deliberate construct, showcased to the world what Korea is all about, aside from engineering, aside from very professional companies to, to build that out. So it's all about trust, and it's really the notion about building uh, trust when that comes to it. But I would say Chinese brands have come a long way. When I compare to when I taught at SIPs in 2003 and ran the brand elective. I think the awareness of the brand and the brand toolbox was very shallow. And I don't blame it because it was early on and China weren't focused on that. But you go back or you go forward, move forward rapidly 20 years, a lot of the Chinese companies have learned. And, and to a certain extent, some of them are better than some of the global peers. So it's, it's maybe not yet an equal playing field, but that's also just because of the the time lag before the Chinese brands and China opened up and started to export brands and the Chinese way of life. But I think there is an incredible opportunity for the for the Chinese firms to to step up even further. And of course, as we speak about uh, China, the majority of our audience is in China um, in terms of um, our fan base. And uh, it's made up, of course, of professionals and executives, uh, including seasoned CEOs and entrepreneurs. So as we're moving towards um, the final stage of our conversation, uh, what I was wondering is whether you have some final words of wisdom or advice or a message for all of our uh, audience in China. Make Chinese brands, and again, it is back to Chinese culture. And as we know, I'm still learning. China is such a China is such a fantastic culture. Deep roots, long history, got a lot to offer uh, on the historical side, on the food side, on the nature side, Chinese spirit, Chinese religion. I mean, whatever makes up Chinese culture and subcultures, bring that out. So first of all, explain and educate to the world what China is all about. The same like the Koreans have to do, the Japanese had to do, and any country, the French had to explain, why would you trust French cosmetics? Why would you trust fashion out of Italy? Because it has been in the making for many, many years. Why would you trust Apple? Well, America is a pretty new concept, but still people love that expression of Apple and what came out of Silicon Valley. And China has to do the same way. So you're not going to reinvent the wheel because China is too old for that. There are 5,000 years of history. You just need to deep, sometimes dig deep into the Chinese history and culture toolbox and take out some of those elements that can be very applicable for your brands, whether you're a food brand, whether you're a services brand. When are we going to see a Chinese hospitality brand, maybe a chain of luxury hotels, airlines? I mean, the world is vast. Just remind yourself that the world already have a lot of brands in most categories. China has been at the forefront, I know, in certain technology sectors and that. 
but just remind yourself that you don't become the 17th brand in the category. There might be other brands playing, but you're going to bring distinctiveness, you're going to bring energy, you're going to bring relevance, you're going to bring differentiation to that category. Whatever that be, it may not be completely game-changing. Sometimes small increments, which are told consistently over time, is all you need. So it's not that you're going to think about being dramatically different to, to make an inroad into the world. Sometimes just by explaining your history and your story, it's about storytelling when you build brands over time, can, uh, can be enough. But of course, China is innovative, as we know, so bring new value. Bring new innovative consumer, se- uh, uh, innovative, uh, consumer uh, segments, uh, consumer solutions, products and services, and all that. Don't un- underestimate the consumer pride uh, globally, right? Because people have built their own set of brands, and this is my selected set of brands. Here comes a new brand. Where are you from? You need to explain, back to what I said, explain and educate why you are different, and then make sure you really, that you are very consistent across all the touch points as you move out. Because all in all, global consumers still have a huge appetite on Asia. I know the pandemic forced all of us to maybe take a step back and we looked at supply chain and most unfortunately most countries in the world on all sides got a little more into themselves borders came down and we kind of we moved around internally in our own cultures i think when we're going to get rid of this pandemic which probably going to take another two to three years it will it will be there will be it will linger for for quite some time but in the timeline of history this is just a small little split second it doesn't matter too much Make sure that China get back into the fray, back into the mainstream and start to educate the world about what China has to offer. And it's not about a winner takes all concept because remind yourself when it comes to branding, people have choices and consumers are fickle these days because they mix and match. So they might not have one social media brand. They might have a few. They might have two different cars. They might have a couple of preferences when it comes to uh, personal fashion to cosmetics to food brands but you just want to make sure that you are relevant and you are part of that category and then don't us- underestimate the emotional drivers and those factors in branding i think they are often underestimated in asia now the funny thing is asia is a very emotional place asia has a lot of the myth a lot of untold stories the subconscious stuff part to religion to myth to beliefs but that's exactly what brands is all, all about. So Asia, and in particular here, China, doesn't have to reinvent anything, but you just need to look hard. You need to somehow frame it in a way so it's globally applicable to enough people, so it doesn't offend people, because the more you don't know, the more you'll be skeptical. So open up, be transparent about what your brand is all about, and you're not going to fix everything. You're not going to be the brand that has all the magics and wonders to the world. You might just fix one or two consumer problems that they try to fix on an everyday level. How do you make consumers safer? How do we become more relevant to consumer lives? How can you be faster? How can you be more relevant? How can you be cheaper? How can you just offer something which consumers may not get from the current set of brands? I think that is a Chinese opportunity in a nutshell. And then get way more people to get to China, to see China, Korea, that's again, Japan early on, had a lot of global tourists to come to the country because that's that's going to cascade what what those countries were all about. And that goes everywhere. People go to France, they go to America, they go to anywhere. Make sure more people get to China over time because that's also going to demystify what China is all about. China is still a very new concept to most people. When it's new and it's unknown, people tend to be more skeptical. So it's also about a long walk. It's a journey to really showcase to the world what uh, what China has to offer. Your insights, Martin, are really a, a treasure trove of ideas, I think, for uh, Chinese uh, leaders and entrepreneurs. And hopefully um, they'll take up some of uh, these ideas. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, I speak to quite a lot of people and it's very, very rare to have somebody um, intertwine so skillfully ideas from um, history, from sociology, from psychology, uh, from business, and to use them to build a positive message in a positive perspective and to um, give people a framework for creating things rather than simply assessing the state of society or of business. And uh, it's truly an absolute pleasure um, to 
uh, have the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, and finally, uh, you mentioned, of course, that it's very important for people to get to China. And I have one last question for you, Martin, which is when are you going to get to China and when will we get to uh, hear more of your fantastic insights here in person? As, as soon as I can uh, get to China, I know you still have a bit of a challenge with your borders, but as I mentioned, I think this is a very short term measure. The world is slowly opening up and I think China will get there eventually. We all know it because we know the world is waiting to, to get to China. So am I. I should have been teaching at the CIBS, but also in terms of, you know, immigration into China has a bit of a challenge. So hopefully that will be by next year. So I don't know, late this year, early next year, but as soon as I can come, I know there are a lot of things we're, that we're also going to do with uh, with your organization and, and your clients and your stakeholders. So as soon as I can get there, in fact, I haven't been to Asia for quite some time. So I'm also looking back, looking looking forward to simply just reconnecting to, to Asia. But the good thing is we're here on video, we're here on virtual connections. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive on China and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to come back very soon and, and connect. And not for one trip, but probably for a more regular uh, intervention with, uh, with, with clients, with you, with your organization, and also with Chinese organizations and hopefully help them, motivate them, encourage them, inspire them, criticize them a bit in terms of building better brands and embrace the world. I would love to do that. So we're absolutely ready to go. We're looking forward to it, Martin, and we'll be waiting for you. Please feel invited to come along um, as soon as um, the situation with the borders starts to open up. Thank you very much again for joining the Branding Boardroom, and we hope to see you again very soon in person. Fantastic. My pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Martin.